Um, well, good morning. We're glad that each of you are here this morning with us, coming to worship on this Labor Day weekend. I uh, hope you haven't been laboring too hard this weekend, um, and hopefully you get to enjoy your day off tomorrow. Uh, for those of you joining us on uh, YouTube, it's probably already Labor Day or later, because that's just how long it takes us to get it on up, but hope you enjoyed your Labor Day. Uh, and we're glad you are joining us this morning uh, as we continue in our Book of Mark uh, study. If you have your Bibles, we're going we're to open up to Mark 14, and we're going to read the first 11 verses. We're going to read the story, and then we're going to unpack it a little bit here um, as, and see what the Lord has for us today. Now the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some sly way to arrest Jesus and kill him. But not during the feast, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany, receiving at the table of, at, in the home of a man known as Simeon, the, the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. I tell you the truth. Wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money, so he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come this morning and ask that you would just speak to our hearts as we uh, look at this story and uh, of the events that took place, a beautiful thing um, that was also interpreted as a bad thing. And, and Lord, we just pray that you would speak to us and show us the journey that we need to take and how we should respond in different situations. And we ask this in your name. Amen. This is a beautiful thing. Does it surprise you? Does it surprise me that Jesus made this is a beautiful thing and in the same setting, that same thing made other people mad? Just kind of the way things work around Jesus sometimes, it seems, right? He, he does something, other people get mad. He does a good thing, other people get mad. Here, someone else does a good thing to him, and people get mad. Jesus considered it ministry. He considered it showing devotion and love and a beautiful thing. She took this alabaster jar probably a small stone flask with a long, slender neck containing about a pint of perfume. Tells us that she broke it, probably meaning she broke the seal, opened it, and then she poured it out over Jesus. This was a, a pure, uh, an aromatic oil from a rare plant root native to India. So it was very costly. And that's what angered others. At least that's what they point at and say that makes them angry. And just a little side note here. This was a beautiful thing, a beautiful ministry that she did. But it was costly. Sometimes doing what God is costly to us. Um, not just financially, but with time and, and other things. Now, um, as I said, this was a beautiful thing. She was anointing him for burial. Now, she didn't necessarily see it that way, is my guess. Uh, none of the apostles around Jesus had understood the whole he's going to the cross. We, we see that as we continue through Mark. We'll see they weren't getting it. They run. They hide. They're scared after. They're, they're just... They're not getting that. I doubt that this lady was getting that in the next couple days Jesus was going to be crucified and buried. But there was something in her heart, a, a, 
a prompting from the Spirit of God that says, do this thing for Jesus. Do this ministry. And she was obedient unto the Lord. And so that is why it's a beautiful thing. She's doing a beautiful thing because she's doing what the Lord is asking and guiding her in, in obedience. But Judas was frustrated. Judas, Judas had it up to here with this. right? He is just mad. He doesn't get it. He doesn't understand Jesus. And so he decides to take things into his own hands. This isn't working. I'm going to do it. And as he takes things into his own hands, he's deciding he is going to force the issue. He's going to turn Jesus over. Now, there's been several theories of why Judas is turning Jesus over and, and what he's doing. And so let's look at uh, some of those this morning. First, they think that maybe he's just responding to the official notice. In John chapter 11, verse 57, we read, But the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone found out where Jesus was, he should report it so that they might arrest him. Judas was the only disciple who was not from Galilee. He was not a Galilean. So of the twelve, he's, he's not as close, relational, uh, where he's from, all this is just a little bit different. And so because of this, some theorize that maybe he felt um, that he was loyal, or he wasn't as loyal, that he had a responsibility to the official notice from the religious leaders. So maybe that was his turning point. Another theory out there is he, he just hopes for material gain. Or his hopes for material gain seem doomed. Remember, the disciples were expecting Jesus to come and conquer. They're expecting him to, to rise up and become the, the, the king of Israel. He would be the, the guy who brings the armies together and leads the destruction of Rome. And with that, the 12 closest to you, you're probably going to be part of the, the uppity ups. Right? You're the, you're the ones that are making decisions. Uh, you're going to be the, the chief of staff, and you're going to be the chief of defense, and you're going to, whatever their roles were, uh, the head of the army. Uh, they would have had stuff within the kingdom of Israel under the reign of Jesus. So maybe he sees, it's just slipping away. Jesus isn't doing anything. He's letting this lady waste money and pour it on his head and all that. And I don't get this. I'm going to turn him over. Another theory is just a love for money. Uh, we, we do learn that he um, was the one who handled the money, which is a little bit surprising when you, th when you stop to think about it. So I heard someone point this out this in the last couple weeks. Matthew was a tax collector. <laughs> Matthew knew how to handle money. Maybe they didn't trust Matthew to handle the money because he had been a tax collector. I don't know. But you would think naturally Matthew would be the guy. But Judas is handling the money. And, and John, if you read in the, in the Gospel of John, he makes the point, man, he was crooked. So he has this, maybe it's just a love for money and he sees an opportunity to make some money and for whatever reason isn't just as loyal to Jesus. Maybe he figures it doesn't matter. I'll make the money and Jesus will just, he's Jesus. And I can make some money on the side. Or maybe it's just the fourth one. And, and this is where I've always kind of fallen in, in, in this camp. And you could even combine this one with the love for money. Maybe he just got tired of waiting for Jesus to call the troops together. Maybe he just got tired of it and he felt, you know what? I just need to kind of give him a little, a little push in the back. Remember, we saw Jesus' um, his first miracle. When he turns the bottle of wine, and it was his mom says, here, we need some more wine. And he's, he's like, it's not my time yet. And, it was, and then she's like, I just do whatever he tells you, and walks off. And, and so Jesus turns the water into wine. Like a little push. Maybe he felt, I need to give him a little push in the back, and let's get this army going. Let's get this revolt going. If, if they start a right, he'll have to stand up. He'll have to defend himself. And, and I just kind of feel like maybe it was a little, a little shove trying to, Move Jesus in a way to do things the way he wanted it, he believed it was going to be. 
And that wasn't the case. Whatever his reason, whatever, if it's one of these four or something else that we haven't thought of, we do know he's remorseful. He's not happy about what he had chosen to do. Kind of like we are sometimes, huh? <laughs> we make decisions and they go, oh man, why would we do that? Matthew 27, 3-4 tells us, When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priest and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I had betrayed innocent blood. So obviously the, the result that he received was not the result he had hoped for. Whatever his reasoning was. Now, a point that I want us to get this morning from this story and obviously there's several different things in here. I mean, uh, we need to do ministry, and when we do ministry, it can be a beautiful thing that we do, and, and it, it can be costly. That's a point. Um, but there's two points I want to make, and the first one is don't be critical. We don't want to be critical of what God is doing and how he's doing it. Because he doesn't always do it our way. In fact, maybe he, he rarely does it our way. In fact, he doesn't do it our way. When he does it our way, that's because we are lined up and following his will, doing it his way. That, that's the truth. When, 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 we, when everything is happening the way we think it should, that's because we are lined up with God. And that's where we want to be. But Judas was being very critical. We saw that. He, he's, he's angry about this beautiful thing that had taken place. And he doesn't see the beauty in what he's doing, what Jesus was doing, or the lady was doing, sorry. He doesn't see the beauty in that ministry and, and what's taking place. And so he gets very critical. And we can get critical of things as well. We can look at the way other churches are doing things and say, that's not how I would do it. And that might be true, and that's why you go here and not there. And that's fine to say, to have differences and look at the way other people are doing ministry and doing church and say, well, I wouldn't necessarily do it that way, uh, but they're doing a good thing, and I'm not as comfortable with that style of whatever, and so I'm going to go here and go, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's the critiquing and going, getting angry and talking about it and knocking it. Daniel and I were out a, a, a thing the other day for um, uh, church leadership and some stuff here for, in our community. And uh, there's a pastor of great fame and great size of church who takes a lot of hits from the side. Uh, he got big because... He must have compromised and this and that. And people have taken some of his teachings out of context because I've heard him come and teach at leadership conferences, this particular guy. And um, uh, he's explained his philosophy in this, and, and of how doing ministry and some of the terminology that he, he coined. And, um, man, he loves God. He's serving God. He's making an impact for God. Well, the conference we were at, the guy who does it, his, his niche is small church ministry. So ministering to churches that are small, which is the majority of churches in America. Um, most churches are, are 100 or less is what my understanding is if you, of all the thousands of churches across the country. Well, this, this pastor that I've heard these bad, these critical comments and this and that, um, contacted this guy and said, hey, you know, can you come and do a conference or something for us? Because coming out of this pandemic um, and trying to do ministry, we need to kind of think and do things as small church does. We need to kind of divide us up into a more, and we don't know how to do small church ministry because we've just been big for so long. That's a pretty humble comment from a, a, a world-known person. I'm, I'm purposely leaving his name out because I don't want to 
And I leaned over to, to Daniel and said, and that's why I like this guy when other people knock him, something like that. Because he's like, I'm going to learn from other people and do things. They're doing things different. We need to learn to do stuff different. And so instead of just being, well, we'll figure it out. We're big. We've got resources. We'll go on. He said, no, I'm going to ask for help. Yeah. And people have criticized this. And my point wasn't just is to say, we can't just criticize other ministries because of their size or the way they do it. Now, if we see them doing things unbiblical, we see them teaching false teachings. If we see these things, we have a responsibility to, to hold each other accountable and to call each other on those sorts of things. And there's a way of going about doing that. That's not what I'm talking about this morning. I'm just talking about being critical of things that are beautiful things that just maybe don't seem so good to us. We don't need to talk about them, critique them, and only bring, it only brings division to the church. There's three themes, and I've mentioned this that as we've, a few times now, that as we've gone through the New Testament on our Wednesday night Bible study this past year, that really stood out to me um, for whatever reason more so than any other. And this particular, one of, the, sorry, one of them was um, the theme of unity that is talked about in basically almost every book it seemed like of the New Testament, at some point they mentioned about being in unity together, all the different authors. And um, <clears throat> just to give a couple examples. To make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Philippians 2.2. 2. Working together, one mind, loving each other, having this purpose of doing these things together. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. There was another one I left off. But there was tons of them that we, we could have picked from. And I believe unity begins with love. Jesus taught, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Well, how do we show love to one another? It's being in unity. It's, it's doing things together. Focused on the ministry of God together. Now, does this mean we agree 100% on all issues? No. That's not what it means. But it means that we love each other and we, we focus on God together and we move towards God. And this is not just meant in this church. When Jesus says that, just in this church, when you show each other, it's true for just within this church, but it's also true for the bigger body of Christ. That we need to be in unity with other churches. Not just other Assemblies of God churches that have the exact same doctrine in us, but with Baptist churches, Nazarene churches. Churches that are of like mind. In the core, right? In the salvation issues. Those are the things that we, we need to be supportive of one another. Now, how they do things, we may not, we may not agree. You know, we, we have our emphasis as assemblies of God in, in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with evidence and speaking other languages, right? That's, that's kind of one of our, our, our main differences in a lot of people. And there's other people who go, well, that's not for everyone. That's just for certain whatever. You know what? That's not a salvation issue. Is it an important issue? Yes, it's an important issue. But because the church down the street, they believe in God. They believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They believe He lived a perfect life. They believe He died on the cross. They believe He rose from the dead. They believe the only way to come to Him is through believing in Him. But you can't earn it. If that's their core, but then we disagree on what does the baptism of the Spirit mean within the church today, that's not a salvation issue. That's a discussion. It's a agree to disagree. It's a whatever. But if we can come back to this core and do ministry together and support and pray, hey, hey, we don't agree on this or we don't agree on that, but on what really matters. Because they can give some good verses on why we're wrong. We can give some great verses on why we're right, on what we believe. 
So with this core, that's support them. If they're, if they're doing things the way that, it's a beautiful thing. We may, they may be pouring oil on people's head and we're going, that doesn't make sense. But we're called to be in unity. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians about the church is the body of Christ. And when he says the church, he's not just talking about reality of first assembly. Okay, we are a body, and so we need to all work together. And more likely, if we were talking to Paul, he would say, no, 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 you're a part of the body as this group. And then you could break that down to even small. Each individual here plays a part into this body, which then plays a part into the body. So I don't know. Maybe we're a finger. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we're a little toe. I've been told little toes are very, very important. That if you lose a little toe, that you, you have to relearn to walk. And it's just a little toe. So maybe we're a little toe. I don't know. But within that little toe, someone's the toenail. <laughs> someone's the... I, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm trying to take this analogy too deep. But, but my point is, we all make up the body, not just Rialto first. Not just the assemblies of God. But all of us. And there's a big world. There's a lot of people. And, and the truth is, if everyone in Rialto today decided to show up to church, I don't think we have enough seats in all the churches in Rialto for them to have one. It, it's a huge task that God has given us to go and make disciples. And there is a huge difference of people who are going to hear the gospel differently, receive it. They, some will never enter into the church to hear it. It's just not going to happen. That's why it's so important that we all learn to become storytellers and st telling Jesus' story and telling our story. Because sometimes that's the only time they're going to go to church is in your front yard when you were taking out your trash can and you ran into your neighbor and you start talking. Right? And so we work together in that focus of Making disciples. Having people become disciples and then teaching and training them. And how we go about doing that can vary from church to church. But it is important that we're all in unity, supporting one another. I was thinking about it. When you're not in unity, how you stumble around and look. And, and, and the illustration that came to my mind was a baby learning to walk. Right? They're not coordinated. And what it, what it means they're co not coordinated means their body isn't functioning together in unity yet. Their, their, their feet are not going as fast as their, their big heavy head is taking them forward. Right? So they can't keep up. And, but once, <laughs> once they learn that coordination, it's about every parent is going, why did we teach them to walk? <laughs> because they're all over the place and they're fast. You know, there are some two-year-olds faster than mom and dad. Um, um, Michelle loves to tell a story about being very pregnant with Adeline, and, and Jaden at a store just took off running. She's very pregnant, and she's just like, help me grab that kid, you know, type of a thing, because um, he just darted. When that, when that unity of the body comes, it's amazing that they can climb up, what they can do, what they can jump over, what a little body can do. Oh, when the church is united. This one locate, when we are united as a body and moving forward, doing what we are supposed to do as we contribute to the bigger body, the whole body of Christ. But the impact and the things we can do. Oh, that will be awesome. And then as the whole church works together in unity to do, what a beautiful, beautiful thing it will be. And we should not be critical of any of that. Um, what we need to do as individuals and a church is to find our niche in ministry and then do that to the best that we can. And when we do that, don't be critical how others are doing it, but just continue to move in doing what God has asked us to do or you to do as an individual. When we're not in unity, it becomes easy to become critical. 
But this also relates to us here. It can be easy to be critical within the side. I was kind of talking about outside the church, but it can get easy to be critical within the church on how things are happening and how things are going. Um, there are many things that people can hear. Oh, we sing too many songs, not enough songs. We can complain that we, we don't have uh, a live band with our ladies singing yet. And pray with me as we are on that journey of finding some musicians. Um, pastor speaks too long. He speaks too short. Doesn't tell enough stories or tell enough jokes or tells too many or too little, whatever. We've been in the book of Mark all year long. When are we going to get out of the book of Mark? October 31st. <laughs> There's your answer. I once heard a story about a pastor who had a lady come to him after his Father's Day message and got on to him that it wasn't a good Father's Day message because he didn't tear the, the, the fathers apart enough. It wasn't hard enough on them. And if you think about it, they're often a Mother's Day is always, we love moms, moms are great, this or that. Dad, you got to be a better dad. you got to stop doing this, start doing this. <laughs> and, and there's this, that happens. And, and this particular pastor had done a message on, more like a Mother's Day message to fathers, I guess. And this pastor looked at this lady and said, you don't tell me what to preach, God tells me what to preach. We can get so critical about things and, and remember, we need to support and be in unity and moving forward. And if someone is doing something, and I'm not saying it when it's wrong to ask a question, why are we doing it this way? Or why did you do it this way? And okay, God led you and this is, okay, well, all right. And we, we support that. Now, if there's something that comes up that is, Unbiblical? Yeah, well, then we, we work on that. We call that. We may not all take the things into our own hands and try to force change, although some have. But when we are critical, it makes it hard for you to get anything from God. And if you talk to others, you're only going to cause division. And I want to encourage us to that. This is, this is not a message that is in any way um, to this church body because of things that are happening. I haven't heard any of these things. But I think it's always good to come back to these things to prevent it from becoming an issue. And that's where I think we are as a church. I haven't heard of this stuff happening. And we're in a unique situation right now as a church. It's been an interesting year and a half now or more for everybody, for all churches. And, and what I am seeing here, I'm hearing other pastors and stuff I'm talking to, um, or other pastors I've talked to who've talked to other pastors, it's so similar. Um, our core has been good. Numbers are down. Finances have stayed solid because the core has stayed there. But the people who come once or twice a month, we haven't seen them come back. We, you know, a lot of these same things. So, so and that's we got to figure that out. Why are they coming? How do they come back? But, but that's what the unique situation, and I think it's a great situation. Because we get to say, what is the best way to reach people? See, we were in a rut doing things the same way we've been doing for years. But right now we're in a place where it's time to, and, and some of us are, we're, we're talking, I've mentioned this several times, and it's, it's going slower than I would like, but that's just the way it is of getting children's ministry going again. And as you look around, we have, we have two, three, four here, but they're not children's ministry. These are all teenagers. They're a youth group. Well, that's probably part of why it's kind of slow. <laughs> but we have families that are connected to this church that we can start reaching out and say, hey, we've got kids' ministry, we're doing this. And, and maybe as we're dreaming up kids' ministry, maybe it'll look a little bit different than what kids' ministry used to be like. I don't know. But this is the time to do that, to make adjustments and dream and, and, and think, hey, what would be a better way to reach kids in 2021 
And how could we do that? And so stuff might look different. Or it might look the same. I don't know. But whatever it is, as our team develops and prays through and is lead, we are supportive of that. The same thing as we move back into youth ministries. Does youth ministry need to look the way it always did before? I don't really know what it looks like anymore, but I know in, in my day and then when I helped run youth here, it looked like it did back when I was youth pastoring. It was start with a game, do a couple songs, uh, have a message, and, and then go. You know, there was just this kind of think about it. Maybe it doesn't look like that anymore. I don't know. But this is the time to figure that out. And as we adjust and make changes and we do things a little differently, we pray and support it and go do a beautiful thing. And we move forward. See, because what it really comes down to, all Christians have the same call, to make disciples and to teach them. There are many ways to do this, and we should be in unity with us and with other churches in whatever way that might be. We can be in unity and have disagreements about certain issues as long as we're in unity on those core values that I've already mentioned. But here's the thing. Sometimes there's going to be stuff that doesn't look like a beautiful thing to you. So what do we do? Whether it's in our church, a church down the street, whatever it might be, what do we do? Take it to God. What if Judas takes it to Jesus first? I mean, he did hear, Jesus did respond and tell him, but he didn't, didn't listen to Jesus. When we take it to God, we need to be willing to receive the answer he gives. That's what was wrong with Judas. He wasn't willing to receive the answer that God gave him through Jesus' words there, right? So you take it to God in prayer. And as you're praying about it, he might change the thing without you mentioning it to anyone else. You just start praying about it and talking to him and things might, if it's out of tune, it's not right on, he might just change it. Or a bigger surprise, he may change you. He might change your heart and go, you know what? No, no, no. When, when I was hired as a youth pastor in Riverside 23, four years ago, man, almost a quarter of a century ago, he, Pastor Sturgeon told me this. He goes, you're going to do my youth pastor, and you're going to do things that I don't like. And you better do things that I don't like, because that's why I'm hiring you. He recognized that youth ministry and things were not going to be run the way he runs a church, but it was going to, he recognized we needed to do things that would impact and draw kids and impact their lives. And he knew he wasn't always going to like it, and that was okay. You better do it. Another pastor I met um, probably eight, nine years later was talking about his church, and, and they had a, a Sunday night service and during that Sunday night service, they had started a young adult's, basically a church. Um, had its own name, its own worship team, its whatever. And they were meeting on the same campus at the same time. And this would be 18-year-olds to young families in their early 30s, to, or mid-30s or so. And he told me, he goes, you know what? I, I, I hate it that they don't come to my service. I really think we should all be in my service. But they're not coming. So I'm going to have them and let them do this because then they're at least here getting the gospel, getting the message. So, so this is the type of mentality and attitude that we need to have. Is like, hey, it may not be the way we exactly want it, but people are being reached with the message. And it can change our heart and still not be real happy about that. Or he might just give you a way to make a difference. A way to help out. A way of uh, might put a word on your heart to do to say something. So the first thing we do is we take it to God. And then follow God's leading. He might tell you, go talk to the pastor about that. And maybe you need to do that. I don't mind. I don't mind people asking me. I've had people ask me questions and point and I and 
and that they didn't like, and I explained to them why we were doing it. And if I'm confident that that's what God wants us to do, I will explain that to you and how and why I think that's it. And you might point out something to me and go that I go, hmm, I hadn't seen it from that angle. But it's all done in conversation and in love, which is what I think love leads to unity. And so that's my message to you. And one more thing as we close. Um, I think one of the best ways to work and be in unity is as we build relationship. And uh, in the last year and a half, two years before COVID, one of our big pushes as a church was trying to quarterly have church around tables and around food and to do stuff. And, and the idea was to build relationship. And building relationship then helps us to love one another more, which then brings us to more unity. And so as we continue to move through this COVID stuff and make decisions, and, and hopefully at some point we'll be able to do things like that more and more often and whatnot. Um, but in the meantime, there is something I thought, you know what we can do? We, we, we can need to hang out with each other a little bit more than just on Sunday at church. And so as I was thinking about it, I was like, you know what, we can go to lunch together from time to time. And I know not all of us can afford to go to lunch every week. I can't do that every week. But from time to time, or you know, once or twice a month, or something, I think this could be a good thing to do. So what I'm going to suggest that next week, so I, I thought about just doing it today. And I, well, I want to give people a heads up, and it's Labor Day weekend or whatever. Um, there's a Shakey's Pizza now right down here. It used to be Sizzler um, between Foothill and Baseline. Or right off, just past Baseline, I think. I'm not sure. Baseline and Riverside Avenue on the left. It used to be Sizzlers. It's now a Shakey's. And I thought, after church, whoever wants to go, let's just go there. I'm going to go there next week. Um, and if you're someone who goes to lunch every week, feel free to join. And so let's just spend more time together. And if you're going to lunch the next week somewhere, just let people know, hey, we're going over here. And if you want to join us, hey, hey we're going to be there. If you're going to lunch somewhere, why don't you come over here? If you're in a position that you can invite someone and say, hey, come and I'll buy your lunch, even better, especially if we see visitors in the church. That'd be a cool thing to do. But just this, just, and that's, I wanted to say it from here and in this way, because I didn't want everyone to feel like if someone asks you or invites you, that they're, they're paying for you. <laughs> I, want, I want everyone to go, we're going to invite and let people know where we're going, so if you're going, you could feel free to join us. And if they want to pay for you, they can add that in on their own and say it. Um, but I just think it'd be a, kind of a, a, a good thing to do. And it doesn't mean everyone in the church goes to there. I mean, you know, some people don't like pizza. And they're like, you know what, they're going to, I'm going here. If you're going, just let people know. And, and let's build that relationship and, and work on that loving and that unity uh, type of a thing. Because um, I know some, uh, some people do that. And some people don't. They just go home. And maybe you like to go home and you make a little bit extra and then invite a family. And say, hey, I, I'm not going out to eat, but I threw something in the crock pot. And I'm, we're having this when we get home if you want to join us. And just build relationship. I think it would be a beautiful thing. Um, to do that. And I think it would help us in this direction of the message as well. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love and all that you do and have done for us. I pray that you would just guide us <clears throat> um, in, in uh, supporting one another. And, and I thank you for this church because they have been very supportive uh, of the ministries and the different things happening in this church. And uh, it ha has not been a critical um, thinking, speaking church, at least not in my ears. And I'm grateful for that. And Lord, and I, we listen to this message more as a reminder that we are on that path and to stay on that path. And as things change, if things change, and that we would always handle it properly and with love, and we would recognize the beautiful things. Lord, that we would never try to force ministry um, that you haven't led us into doing, but that we would obediently follow you. And Lord, would you lead us and guide us and speak to us as we come together, as we become healthier and in, in, in our relationship with you as individuals, as a church. 
um, that you would empower us to do your ministry. Lord, we want to reach people who do not know you. Um, and help us to do that. Show us the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Um, Wednesday night, we are starting our study on Revelation. I hope everyone is going, will be able to be there. As I said last week, not only do you learn and grow if you come, but you then contribute to the conversation and you give to us and we learn and grow and it's a blessing two ways. So we would love to see everyone here on Wednesday night as we walk through Revelations together. Um, it is an important aspect uh, that we continue to grow in our faith and, and, and dive, and we're going to dive deeper in Revelations over those next, I don't know how long, probably the rest of the year, but, um, or more. Uh, hope you can be here 7 o'clock on Wednesday. God bless.